Welcome to My Vaccine is Jesus. Before we begin, a short prayer. All blessing, honor, glory, and worship to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, for now and forever, and unto ages of ages. Amen. I pray to Almighty God to be filled with the Holy Spirit, so my power to speak truth without error, and to interpret Holy Scripture correctly. All truth comes from God. Any errors are my own. I also pray that you, the viewer and listener, may likewise be filled with the Holy Spirit, so that any truth I speak or any scripture that I interpret correctly is welcome to your heart, your mind, and your soul. Today's discussion is in the Response to Muslim Comments, Questions, and Objections playlist and is entitled Episode Number 3, Let Us Begin the Discussion. Here we are at a YouTube channel of a brother, Comment War, the Jesus Christ follower. As you can see when I grabbed the screenshot here, he had 1.31 thousand subscribers. Go check out his channel and subscribe, please. And here's the video. We're going to look at a comment on why is Adam called a son of God? Sam Shamoon bitch slaps Amin Didot. Luke chapter 3, verse 38. It's a 2 minute 36 second video, so go check it out as well. And here's the comment we're going to focus this video on. It's from Ahali Aldahir, who's a Muslim. Jesus was not crucified. Quran chapter 4, verse 157 says, They that said in boast, We killed Christ Jesus, the son of Mary, the messenger of Allah, but they killed him not, nor crucified him, but so was made to appear to them. And those who differ therein are full of doubts with no certain knowledge, but only conjecture to follow. For of a surety they killed him not. The person on the cross was Jesus' doppelganger, Thomas, who was known as the twin, Taum in Aramaic and Thomas in Greek. Thomas was a Galilean, as were all of the disciples. There are two Gospels which mention Thomas's relationship to Jesus. The first Gospel mentions Thomas's given nickname as Judah, Judas in Greek, and his nickname as Thomas, so he is referred to as Judas Thomas, according to the Gospel of Thomas. These are the secret sayings that the living Jesus spoke in Didymus. Judas, Judas Thomas recorded. Didymus means twin in Greek. The Gospel of Thomas dates to as early as the epistles of Paul and is composed of the sayings of Jesus. So let's look at Quran, Surah 4, Ayah 157. And for boasting. Now these were the Jews. Again, go look at Quran chapter 4. And the verses preceding it, and you'll see it was Jews and for boasting. These are the individuals boasting. We killed the Messiah, Jesus, son of Mary, the messenger of Allah, but they, the Jews, neither killed nor crucified him. It was only a maid to appear so to them. Even those who argue for this crucifixion are in doubt. They have no knowledge whatsoever, only making assumptions that they, the Jews, certainly did not kill him. We'll get to that later. Matthew chapter 10, verses 2 through 4. Now, the names of the twelve apostles are these. The first, Simon, who is called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, Philip and Bartholomew, Thomas, and Matthew, the publican, James, the son of Alphaeus, and Labaius, whose surname was Thaddeus, Simon, the candidate, and Judas Iscariot, who also betrayed him. And you can see in the Greek there, Thomas is Thomas, Judas is Judas. They are two separate individuals. Mark chapter 3. Verses 16 through 19. And Simon, he surnamed Peter, and James, the son of Zebedee, and John, the brother of James, and he surnamed them Boanerges, which is the sons of thunder, and Andrew, and Philip, and Bartholomew, and Matthew, and Thomas, and James, the son of Alphaeus, and Thaddeus, and Simon the Canaanite, and Judas Iscariot, which also betrayed him, and they went into an house. So these are different individuals Thomas, Thomas, and Judas Iscariot, Judas. Luke chapter 6, verses 14 to 16. Simon, whom he also named Peter, and Andrew his brother, James, and John, Philip, and Bartholomew, Matthew, and Thomas, James the son of Alphaeus, and Simon called Zelotes, and Judas, the brother of James, and Judas Iscariot, which also was the traitor. So you'll notice there's two Judases in this particular list in Luke, and again, Thomas, Thomas, Judas, Judas. Different Greek names. Now let's look at the Gospel of Thomas. Assigning a date to the Gospel of Thomas is very difficult because it is difficult to know precisely to what a date is being assigned. Scholars have proposed a date as early as 3rd century AD, the 200s, or as late as 4th century AD, the 300s, depending upon whether the Gospel of Thomas is identified the original core of sayings with the author's published text, with the Greek or Coptic text, or with parallels and other literature. So notice the Gospel of Thomas is from the 200s to the 300s. So Holly Aldier makes a claim that it dates to as early as the epistles of Paul. Hmm. So as you can see, the epistles of St. Paul were written sometime between A.D. 48 and A.D. 68. That's two to three hundred years prior to the timing of the Gospel of Thomas. 
So obviously, Holly Aldehir does not know what he or she is talking about, makes a claim as a statement of fact that is completely false. Hmm. Continuing. The secret words that the Savior spoke to Judas Thomas, which I, even I, Matthias, wrote down while I was walking, listening to them speak with one another. The Savior said, Brother Thomas, we have time in the world. Listen to me, and I will re reveal to you the things you have pondered in your mind. Now, since it has been said that you are my twin and true companion, examine yourself and learn who you are, in what way you exist, and how you will come to be. Since you will be called my brother, it is not fitting that you be ignorant of yourself. Evidently, this comes from the Gospel of Thomas, which, of course, is not canon, was not written by St. Thomas, and again, comes from 200 to 300 years prior excuse me, 200 to 300 years subsequent to the um, epistles of St. Paul and the gospel accounts that are canon, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Thomas, a.k.a. Judas Thomas, was a very loyal follower who volunteered to take Jesus' place. And there's another statement of fact, just like the statement of fact that was completely false that this individual made earlier. So we know how to uh, take these uh, statements of this individual. A volunteer to take Jesus' place so that Jesus could escape, and Jesus with the rest of the group could reassemble in Galilee as was planned. Mark chapter 14, verse 28, Mark chapter 16, verse 7. According to the Gospel of John chapter 11, Thomas had earlier volunteered to die with Jesus when Jesus, upon hearing of the death of Lazarus, proposed to return to Judea where there was a previous attempt to stone him to death. Why? Because he declared to be God. Mark chapter 14, verses 27 to 28. And Jesus saith unto them, All ye shall be offended because of me this night. For it is written, I will smite the shepherd, and the sheep shall be scattered. Who's the shepherd that's going to be smited, Lord Jesus? To be smited is to be killed. Oh, I will smite the shepherd, so Jesus is going to be killed, and the sheep, the disciples, are going to be scattered. Oh, okay. But after that, I am risen. Oh, he's going to rise from the dead. Oh, okay. I will go before you into Galilee. I mean, isn't this amazing? This individual quotes these verses where Lord Jesus states he's going to be killed and resurrected as, 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 as proof of the opposite. Mark chapter 16, verses 1 to 7. And when the Sabbath was passed, Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of James and Salome had brought sweet spices that they might come and anoint him. And this is when he was in the tomb. Oh, after he was crucified and physically killed, yeah. Uh, and very early in the morning, the very... First day of the week, they came into the sepulchre, the rising of the sun, and they said among themselves, Who shall roll away the stone from the door of the sepulchre? And when they looked, they saw that the stone was rolled away, for it was very great. And entering into the sepulchre, they saw a young man sitting on the right side, clothed in a long white garment, and they were affrighted. And he saith unto them, Be not affrighted. Ye seek Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. Wait a minute, but the Quran states he wasn't crucified. Okay, he is risen. Oh, he rose from the dead. Okay, he is not here. Behold the place where they laid him, but go your way. Tell his disciples and Peter that he goeth before you into Galilee. There you shall see him as he said unto you. I mean, isn't this amazing? This individual quotes these verses where Lord Jesus states he's going to be killed, states he's going to resurrect, is resurrected, and that's why he's going to meet them in Galilee. Okay. John chapter 11, verses 13 to 16. Howbeit Jesus spake of his death, but they thought, this is of Lazarus' death, but they thought that he had spoken of taking a rest and sleep. Then said Jesus unto them plainly, Lazarus is dead, and I'm glad for your sakes that I was not there, to the intent ye may believe. Nevertheless, let us go unto him. Why are they going to believe? Because he's going to raise Lazarus from the dead, proving he is who he says he is, the divine eternal Son of God. Then said Thomas, which is called Didymus, unto his fellow disciples, let us also go that we may die with him, that die with Lazarus. John chapter 12, verses 9 through 11. This is how important Lazarus was in raising him from the dead. Much people of the Jews therefore knew that he was there, and they came not for Jesus' sake also. This is his triumphal entry into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday but that they might see Lazarus also, whom he had raised from the dead. But the chief priests consulted, they, they put Lazarus also to death. Oh, so they wanted to kill Jesus, and they wanted to kill Lazarus. Because that by reason of him, many of the Jews went away and believed upon Jesus. Believed what? That he was the divine Messiah, which he was and is. John chapter 1, verse 11 through 13 in the prologue. He, Lord Jesus, came unto his own, and his own received him not. Right? He went to the people of Israel, and most of them did not receive him for who he truly was, the divine Messiah. But as many as received him to them, gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name, which were born not of blood, nor the will of flesh, nor the will of man, but of God. What's the will of God? The will of the Father. And this is the will of him that sent me, the will of the Father, that every one which seeth the Son and believeth on him may have everlasting life, and I will raise him up on the last day.
What's the last day? The day of final judgment. And as you'll see, the day of resurrection, which even the Muslims believe in and the Quran teaches. You see that play out in the gospel accounts in uh, Matthew chapter 25, verses 31 through 46. That's the judgment of the sheep and the goats. And you see it play out in Revelation chapter 20, verses 11 through 15. That's the great white throne judgment. Continuing in Holy Aldehir's comment, John chapter 11, verse 7. Then after this, he, Jesus, said to the disciples, let's go into Judea again. John chapter 11, verse 8. The disciples said to him, Rabbi, the Jews of late sought to stone you, and are you going there again? John chapter 11, verse 16. Thomas, called the twin, said to his fellow disciples, let us also go that we may die with him. Not die with Jesus, but die with Lazarus. The confirmation that it was not Jesus on the cross was given by the imposter, Thomas, who declared in Matthew chapter 27, verse 46, at about the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice, saying, Eli, Eli, laba sabachthani. That is, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Eli, Eli, laba sabachthani is a misquote of Psalm 22, which says in Hebrew, oh, in Hebrew, Eli, Eli, lama abazabthani. Jesus would not have made such a mistake as he was preaching the Torah and the Tanakh in the synagogues. This misquotation is an affirmation that it was not Jesus on the cross. This misquotation may have been a subtle scoff to the elder priests, the teachers of the law, the elders, as well as the other jeering bystanders who were mocking him. Matthew chapter 27, verse 41, Mark chapter 15, verse 31, Luke chapter 23, verse 45, that they had crucified the wrong man. John chapter 11, verses 7 through 12. Then after that, saith he to his disciples, let us go into Judea again. His disciples say unto him, Master, the Jews of late sought to stone thee. Why? Because he declared himself to be God. And goest thou thither again? Jesus answered, Are there not twelve hours in the day? If any man walk in the day, he stumbleth not, because he seeth the light of this world. But if a man walk in the night, he stumbleth, because there is no light in him. These things saith he, and after that he saith unto them, Our friend Lazarus sleepeth, but I go, that I may awake him out of sleep. Again, he's dead, he's going to raise him from the dead. Then saith, said his disciples, Lord, if he sleep, he shall do well. Matthew chapter 27, verse 46 and about the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice, saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. That is to say, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. Mark chapter 15, verse 34. And at the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice, saying, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which is being interpreted, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? So notice in Matthew, Eli, Eli, in Mark, Eloi, Eloi. Why the discrepancy? The thought is, is that Mark's gospel was based on St. Paul's preaching in Rome, Aramaic. And Eloi is Aramaic for my God, and Eli is Hebrew for my God. Now, how about Sabachthani? Sabachthani. As you can see, it's Greek, Strong's word, 55, 18, Sabachthani, you have forsaken me. It's an Aramaic transliterate word, derived from Hebrew, but it's Aramaic. Sabachthani, you have forsaken me. Thou hast forsaken me. So it's Aramaic. Psalm 22, verse 1. To the chief musician upon Ajaleth Shahar, a psalm of David, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Why art thou so far from helping me and from the words of my roaring? Eli, Eli, lama azabtani, which is the Hebrew word. So azabtani is the Hebrew word, and sabachthani is the Aramaic word. Oh, I see. And it's derived from shebak to leave, let alone, Aramaic, corresponding to the root of Shobek, to leave, let alone. That's where it's derived from. Sabachthani, definition and meaning, Bible dictionary. Sabachthani, why hast thou forsaken me? Part of Christ's fourth cry on the cross, Matthew chapter 27, verse 46, Mark chapter 15, verse 34. This with the other words uttered with it as given in Mark is Aramaic. Syro-Chaldaic, the common dialect of the people of Palestine in Christ's time in the whole, is a translation of the Hebrew given in Matthew of the first words of the 22nd Psalm. Strong's Greek, 45:18, Sabachthani, you have forsaken me. Sabachthani, you have forsaken me. Original word, Sabachthani, part of speech Aramaic, transliterated word, indeclinable Hebrew, transliteration, Sabachthani, phonetic spelling, definition, you have forsaken me, usage, thou hast forsaken me. Word study, Eli, Eli, Laba, Sabachthani, part one. Something even more curious is that the passage suggests that Jesus is quoting Psalm 22, yet in Hebrew, that phrase is Eli, Eli, Lama, Abazathi, Ab, not Sabachthani. However, the Jewish Targum, Aramaic translation of the Hebrew Bible, does use the Arabic word, 
show back, I guess, in Psalm 22, 1, which is probably why the scribes added the footnote, which being, oh, so that's the Aramaic. Matthew 27, 46, in about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, that is my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? It is curious that Matthew transliterated this into the Greek as the Hebrew Eli, and Mark translated this as Aramaic Eloi. Lama is Hebrew, Lema is Aramaic, and is shown as that in both Gospels and the Greek, but translators will render it as Lama, Hebrew, for whatever reason. Secondly, why did they transliterate, make a word sound the same in another language into Greek at all? Why not just write out in Greek, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? As for the word sabachthani, well, we are not sure. It appears to be from the Aramaic word shobek, which means to forsake or abandon for a purpose. The Aramaic word just simply to abandon, to forsake, because it is unwanted is ta'atani. However, it can be argued that the root word is really shwak, which means to be kept, spared, or allowed, or to fulfill an end. If Jesus had really meant that God had abandoned him or forgot him, he would have used the word ta'atani, forsake, or nashatani, forget. Something even more curious is that the passage suggests that Jesus is quoting Psalm 22, one yet in Hebrew, that phrase is eli, eli, lama, abaz, ethi, not sabachthani. However, the Jewish Targum, Aramaic translation of the Hebrew Bible, does use the Aramaic word shobek, SBQ in Psalm 22, one, which is probably why the scribes added the footnote, which being interpreted means. This is in, in accordance with the Eastern Church, which teaches that the scribes who wrote this out in Greek really did not understand what the phrase really meant. So they merely transliterated into the Greek rather than translate it, and then put in a short commentary or their own opinion and indicated this by the words, that is to say. In other words, they were not sure they'd correctly quoted Jesus, so they assumed he was seeking, speaking Psalm 22 one and put in a little commentary to offer their opinion as to what he really said. Indeed, Jesus could have been misquoted from scribes or witnesses at the crucifixion if they were from Judea, for the Judeans spoke a southern dialect of Aramaic, but Jesus and his disciples from the northern part of Israel, Galilee, where they spoke a northern dialect of Aramaic. So Jesus would have, would have spoken with a northern accent, and sometimes what he said might not be clear to the people speaking a southern dialect. This is probably why some thought he was calling for Elijah, because Eli or Eloi could mean Elijah, like a, like a nickname for Elijah. My belief that all scriptures and the inspired word of God, which I share, makes me a little uncomfortable suggesting that the Bible misquoted Jesus. If the Bible teaches Jesus said, Sabachthani, then that is what he said, no misquotation. That's right, that's what he said because it's Aramaic. Now what's interesting, the same individual in another uh, comment on uh, that particular video, Holly Aldehir said this, these anonymous authors wrote in Greek instead of the Aramaic language spoken in Palestine. So he admits that Lord Jesus would have been speaking Aramaic. So that's just the Aramaic. So that proves nothing. Surely not what he's suggesting. Matthew 27, verses 38 to 44. Then were there two thieves crucified with him, one on the right hand and another on the left. And they that passed by reviled him, wagging their heads and saying, thou that destroyest the temple and buildest it in three days, save thyself. If thou be the Son of God, who does that remind you of? Come down from the cross. Likewise, also the chief priests mocking him with the scribes and elders said, he saved others, himself he cannot save, if he be the king of Israel. Let him now come down from the cross and we will believe him. So come down from the cross, don't be crucified and we'll believe you. He trusts in God, let him deliver him now, if he will have him, for he said I am the son of God. That these also which were crucified with him cast the same in his teeth. Mark chapter 15, verses 27 to 32. And with them they crucified two thieves, the one on his right hand and the other on his left. And the scripture was fulfilled, which said, and he was numbered with the transgressor. That's from Isaiah uh, chapter 53. And they that passed by railed on him, wagging their heads and saying, Ah, thou that destroyest the temple and buildest it in three days, save thyself and come down from the cross. Likewise also, the chief priests mocking said among themselves with the scribes, He saved others himself he cannot save. Let Christ, the King of Israel, descend now from the cross that we may see and believe. And then they were crucified with him, reviled him. So notice the wickedness of it. What is the will of the Father? To see and believe upon the Son as your Lord and your God, you'll see. And these wicked, satanic individuals are saying, come down from the cross and we will see and believe. So notice, don't be crucified, which is satanic, and we'll believe you. Hmm. Luke chapter 23, verses 35 to 37, and the people stood beholding, and the rulers also with them derided him, saying, he saved others, let him save himself, if he be Christ the chosen of God. And the soldiers also mocked him, coming to him and offering him vinegar, and saying, if thou be the king of the Jews, save thyself. 
Hmm. So that spirit, don't get crucified, it's a satanic spirit. Hmm. And that satanic spirit appears to be in the Quran, doesn't it? Matthew chapter 16, verses 21 to 23. From that time forth began Jesus to show unto his disciples how he must go unto Jerusalem and suffer many things of the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised again the third day. So he had to give up his life and raise himself. Then Peter took him and began to rebuke him, saying, Be it far from thee, Lord, this shall not be done unto thee. No, 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 you're not going to be crucified. You're not going to be killed. You're not going to have to raise again. But he turned and said unto Peter, Get thee behind me, Satan. Thou art an offense unto me, for thou savest not the things that be of God, but those that be of men. So him not being crucified is satanic. Hmm. Matthew chapter 4 Verse 1, then 5 through 7. Then was Jesus led up of the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. This is following his uh, baptism in the River Jordan by John the Baptizer. Verse 5. Then the devil, so who's, who's being tempted? Lord Jesus. Then the devil taketh him up into the holy city and setteth him on a pinnacle of the temple and saith unto him, If thou be the Son of God, where do we see that? Cast thyself down, for it is written, He shall give his angels charge concerning thee, and in their hands they shall bear thee up, lest at any time thou dash thy foot against a stone. Notice, he's going to be saved. You're not going to even touch the ground. You're not going to be hurt. Jesus said unto him, It is written again, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. Right there, Lord Jesus declared himself God. How is that? Well, in verse 1, Lord Jesus is being tempted. And verse 7, he rebukes Satan by telling him, Don't tempt the Lord thy God. What does that mean? That Jesus was his Lord and was his God, just like he's my Lord and he's my God, just like he's your Lord and he's your God, and just like he's... um. Uh, Muhammad's Lord and Muhammad's God. And by the way, what's the will of the Father? To see and believe upon the Son as you'll see as your Lord and your God. Now what's interesting is notice that satanic spirit. And there's another satanic spirit which is misquoting scripture like Holly Aldehir does. Because if you read those two verses, it suggests that you know the, the angels are going to prevent you from getting harmed. That comes from Psalm 91. See, Satan quoted verses 11 and 12, but not verse 13. Verse 11, for he shall give his angels charge over thee to keep thee in all thy ways. Verse 12, they shall bear thee up in their hands, lest thou dash thy foot against a stone. Verse 13, thou shalt tread upon the lion and adder, the young lion and the dragon shalt thou trample under feet. And Satan is the serpent, is the adder, is the dragon. And notice, yes, Lord Jesus, that's, that's his crucifixion right there. Notice he's going to be born up. He's going to be, right? supported on the two beams of the cross, and by doing so, he's going to crush Satan. There you go. So notice the satanic spirit misquoting scripture, leaving things out to change the meaning, like Holly Aldehir does, and the other satanic spirit is basically say, no, no, don't get crucified. Don't get crucified, Jesus. And that's uh, what Holly Aldehir thinks the gospel actually teaches. Wow, how satanic. According to Mark 1540, there were women followers who also witnessed the crucifixion. These women knew it wasn't Jesus on the cross, another one of these statements of fact that's completely false. They were anxious to get Thomas down before the jeering temple authority found out the truth. The temple authority knew that Jesus was a Galilean. They would have fled to his clan for protection. If they had discovered the ruse, these priests and Pharisees would have sent the Romans after him and his disciples. According to Matthew 28, 16, Jesus and his disciples made the journey safely to Galilee, where he openly ate and drank with his disciples. According to Jesus' declaration in Mark 12, 25, the resurrected body will be like that of an angel. According to Hebrews 1, 14, angels are ministering spirits. According to Jesus in Luke 24, 39, a spirit does not have flesh and bones as you see that I have. Jesus then proceeded to show his disciples his hands and feet, which bore no wounds. <laughs> He's showing him his hands. Be with, uh, it's, it's really incredible. Wow, this, notice the satanic spirit. Unbelievable. The, the just complete falsehoods. Born of wounds as he ate and drank without difficulty. So Jesus himself demonstrated that he was alive and unhurt and perfectly able to enjoy a meal because he had not been crucified. Wow. Mark chapter 15, verses 40 to 41. There were also women looking on afar off among whom was Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of James the Less and of Joses and Salome, who also, when he was in Galilee, followed him and ministered unto him and many other women which came up with him unto Jerusalem. Okay, so they're watching him be crucified. Okay. John chapter 14, verse 6. Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by, by, by me. So Lord Jesus is the truth. And Holly Aldir is suggesting that Lord Jesus is a liar, was a trickster. 
Who's the liar and murderer? That's Satan. And Lord Jesus destroyed Satan by his crucifixion. John chapter 8, verse 44. Ye of your father, the devil, and the lusts of your father ye will do. He was a murderer from the beginning, and abode not in the truth, because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he is a liar and the father of it. So notice Holly Alda here. Yeah, Lord Jesus was just a liar. He lied. He wasn't crucified. Incredible. Matthew chapter 28, verses 16 to 20. Then the 11 disciples went away into Galilee, into a mountain where Jesus had appointed them. And when they saw him, they worshiped him. Why? Because he's their Lord and their God. But some doubt. Isn't it interesting? So they're seeing his resurrected body. They know he's their Lord. They know he's their God, or they should. And some still doubt shows the spirit of doubt in people, even in them. And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. So he has all power in heaven. Uh, that's God. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. And that's why the uh, New Testament is written in Koine Greek, because he's, they're supposed to teach all the nations in the lingua franca of the Roman Empire. The nations was Koine Greek. Teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. How can he be with his believers forever? That would mean he's omnipresent. That's right. But that's a characteristic that's unique to God. Exactly. Another declaration of being God right there. Only God has that power. I don't have that power. You don't have the power. Muhammad doesn't have the power. Satan doesn't have the power. Lord Jesus has that power. Mark chapter 12, verses 18 to 27. So let's see again how Holly Aldehir misunderstands everything. Then came unto him the Sadducees, which say there is no resurrection. So notice, just like Holly Aldehir claims there's no resurrection, these wicked Sadducees didn't believe in the resurrection. And they asked him, saying, Master, Moses wrote unto us, If a man's brother die, and leave his wife behind him, and leave no children, that his brother should take his wife, and raise up seed unto his brother. Now there were seven brethren, and their first took wife, and dying left no seed. And the second took and died, neither left he any seed, and the third likewise. And the seven had her, and left no seed. Last of all, the women died also. In the resurrection, therefore, when they shall rise, right, into resurrected bodies, whose wife shall she be of? them. For the seven had her to wife. And Jesus answering said unto them, Do ye not therefore err, because you know not the scriptures. You don't understand the scriptures, just like Holly Aldir doesn't understand the scriptures, nor the power of God. For when they shall rise from the dead, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are as the angels which are in heaven. See, the angels in heaven don't marry and aren't given in marriage. That's the point. So this is teaching that in the resurrected body, you don't get married and have children. See, in the bodies we have now, these physical bodies, these corruptible bodies, these not immortal bodies, these physical bodies, right? Not resurrected bodies, right? We have children to grow the family of God, to have more people and see upon, be a leave upon Lord Jesus. At that time, all that's been fulfilled. There's no purpose to have children anymore. So that's why the resurrected body is a body. It's a spiritual body. It's a glorified body. It's an immortal body. It's a flesh and bone body, not a flesh and blood body like we have now. But it's a body, right? And why it's like the angels is because we don't get married. That's why, not because we're spirit creatures. Incredible. And it's touching the dead that they rise. Have you not read in the book of Moses how in the bush God spake unto him, saying, I am the God of Abraham, and the God of Isaac, and of God of Jacob. He is not the God of the dead, but the God of the living. Ye there, therefore do greatly err. So obviously saying Abraham and Isaac and Jacob weren't dead. They existed because remember, they didn't believe in any of that. So, but the point is that when you're like the angels, it's not that you're spirit creatures when you're in a resurrected body. You're in a resurrected body, but you don't get married. You don't have children. You don't have offspring. That's the point there. Now let's look at Hebrews because he mentions Hebrews chapter 1, verse 14. Well, let's look at the rest of Hebrews and see what it teaches. We get verses 1 through 5. For God, who at sundry times in a diverse manner spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets. Okay, so prophets are mentioned. Verse 2, hath in these last days spoken to us by his son. Ooh, a little different. So what does that prove right there? Lord Jesus was no prophet, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, hmm. by whom also he made the worlds. So the son is declared creator of the physical dimension and the spiritual dimension right there. Okay. Uh, does that sound like what the Quran teaches? Not at all. Who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person. So the Son is the brightness of the Father's glory. The Son is the express image of the Father's person. Wow. And upholding all things by the word of his power. So everything in heaven and everything in earth is upheld by the power of the word of the Son. Hmm. That's a man. That's a prophet. I don't think so. When he had by himself purged our sins. So Lord Jesus holds 
the molecules in the physical and spiritual dimension together. Your molecules, my molecules, Muhammad's molecules, Satan's molecules. Hmm, that's a man, that's a prophet. I don't think so. And by himself purged sins. Only God can do that. Sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. That's the Father. Being made so much better than the angels. See, this is talking about his created, made, spiritual, resurrected, glorified flesh and bone body. As he hath by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. For unto which of the angels said he at any time, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. And again, I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. Obviously, he's his son. Now, about the being made. Hebrews chapter 2, verse 9. But we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he by the grace of God should taste death for every man. Now, so all of this is contradicted by the teachings of the Quran. Uh, we'll get into that later, but what is this? Hebrews chapter 2, verse 9 is speaking of his initial physical uh, uh, flesh and blood body. Hebrews chapter 1, verse 4 is speaking of his resurrected, glorified spiritual flesh and bone body. And those bodies are made. They're created. He is the eternal divine son, obviously not made, not created. He was the creator. But this body that he inhabited, that he inhabits now, was created. The first one, lower than the angels. The second, which, which he has now, glorified spiritual flesh and bone body, resurrected body greater than the angels. Continuing Hebrews chapter 1, verses um, uh, 6 through 9, forgive the repeat on verse 5 up top. And again, when he bringeth in the first begotten in the world, he saith, and let all the angels of God worship him. Oh, so the Son is to be worshipped. Yeah. Verse 7, and of the angels, he saith, who make his, his angels spirits and his ministers a flame of fire. Notice he's distinguishing the Son from angels. Verse 8, but unto the Son, he saith, thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is the scepter of thy kingdom. The Father just called the Son God. Huh. Why do I call the Son God? Well, the Father calls him God. Isn't that good enough for you? It's good enough for me. Now, verse 9, because people get confused. Thou hast loved righteousness and hated iniquity. Therefore, God, even thy God, hath anointed thee with the oil of gladness above thy fellow. So notice, in verse 8, the Father's calling him God. But in verse 9, he's saying, Son, you have a God. How can this be? See, the divine, eternal Son has no God. But when he took on flesh, when he took on that created body, all flesh has a God, and the Father became his God at that point. Not the God of his divine nature, the God of his human nature. He's a God-man. So God the Father is the God of the man part of the God-man. Do you get it? Continuing verses 10 to 14, And thou, Lord, in the beginning hast laid the foundation of the earth and the heavens of the work of thy hand. That's the Father calling the Son creator. That's not a man. That's not a prophet. That's a God-man. They shall perish, but thou remainest, and they shall wax old as doth a garment, and as a vesture shalt thou fold them up, and they shall be changed, but thou art the same, and thy year shall not fail. Verse 11 and 12 declare what happens in Revelation chapter 20, by the way, in verse 11, where Lord Jesus destroys the old heaven and the old earth with the creation of the new heaven and the new earth, by the way, in Revelation 21. But to which of the angels said he at any time, said my right hand, and I'll make that enemy as thy footstool. That's from Psalm 110. Are they not all ministering spirits sent forth to minister for them who shall be heirs of salvation? Wow, so notice what Hebrews 1 teaches, and then Holly Alda here takes verse 14, completely misunderstands everything, and tries to state that uh, Lord Jesus uh, wasn't crucified and doesn't get resurrected. Incredible. Luke chapter 24, verse 36 to 43. And as they thus spoke, Jesus himself stood in the midst of them and saith unto them, Peace be unto you. But they were terrified and affrighted and supposed that they had seen the Spirit. Why? Because he had died on the cross and now they're seeing him. They think it's the Spirit. I mean, notice the ridiculousness of what Holly Aldir is saying. Yeah, it was all a, a, a ruse. And if that's the case, when he met up with them after he, his little trickery, why did they think he was a ghost? Right? It's ridiculous. And he said unto them, Why are you troubled? And why do thoughts arise in your hearts? Behold my hands and my feet. That is, I myself. Why is he saying that? Because he has the wounds of the crucifixion there. Why does he say that? Handle me and see, for spirit hath not flesh and bones. See, this is his glorified spiritual flesh and bone body. As you see me have. And when he thus spoke, and he showed them his hands and his feet again. And while they yet believed not for joy and wondered why. Because, oh my gosh, he's resurrected just like he said he was. And what did he say unto them? Have ye here any meat? And they gave him a piece of broiled fish and of a honeycomb. And he took it and did eat before them, proving he had a body. Now, it's distinct from what we have. This is a glorified body. This is a spiritual body. This is an immortal body. This is an incorruptible body. This is a resurrected body. 
This is spoken about in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 42 to 49. So also is the resurrection of the dead. It is sown in corruption. This is our body we have now, right? Made lower than the angels. It is raised in incorruption. See, our physical flesh and blood body is sown in corruption, but our glorified spiritual flesh and bone body, resurrected body, will be raised in incorruption. Sown in dishonor, physical body, raised in glory, spiritual body. Sown in weakness, physical body, raised in power, resurrected body. Sown in natural body or physical body, raised a spiritual body. There is a natural body and there's a spiritual body. And so it is written, the first man, Adam, was made a living soul. The last Adam, that's Lord Jesus, was made a quickening or life-giving spirit, how be it. That was not first which is spiritual, that which is natural, and afterward that which is spiritual. See, we have our natural body now, and we're going to have a spiritual body later. The first man, Adam, is of the earth. The second man is the Lord from heaven. Again, proving he's divine. That's his origin. As is the earthy, such as they that are earthy. That's us. As is the heavenly, such as they also that are heavenly. And as we have borne the image of the earthy, right now we bear the image of Adam. We shall also bear the image of the heavenly. So later we're going to have a resurrected body like Lord Jesus currently has. Revelation chapter 1, verse 17 to 18. When I saw him, this is John on the island of Patmos, and he's seeing Lord Jesus, I fell at his feet as dead, and he laid his right hand upon me, saying unto me, Fear not, I am the first and the last. I am he that liveth and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. I have the keys of hell and of death. There's Lord Jesus stating that he died and now he's alive. What died? Did his divine nature die? Impossible. Does human nature die? Yes, but only the physical part of it. See, we have a spiritual part too, right? When our physical bodies die, we don't cease to exist. And, and Islam doesn't teach that either. So this whole idea, when he died, how could he do anything? When we die, we still exist. So again, his divine nature didn't die, but even the spiritual part of his human nature didn't die. Only his physical part of his human nature died for three days, and then he got his resurrected, glorified body. Revelation chapter 2, verse 8. Now, the angel of the church in Smyrna, right, these things saith the first us, which was dead and is alive. Again, him declaring, I was physically dead, and now in this body, I'm alive. It's a glorified spiritual flesh and bone body. Matthew chapter 15, verse 8. This people draweth nigh unto me with their mouth, and honoreth me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. Like Holy Aldi, oh yes, we we honor Islam. We, we honor Lord Jesus. Yeah, they honor him with their lips. Their heart is far from him. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14, why? They don't have the Holy Spirit. They can't understand any of this. But the natural man, like Holy al here, and sadly all Muslims and Muhammad, receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. It's impossible for Holy al here to understand the Gospels. Completely impossible. He does not have the Holy Spirit. My response. At Holly Aldea, you truly are most ignorant. Your central claim is that St. Thomas took the place of Lord Jesus on the cross. You even quote verses from St. John's Gospel. Please review John chapter 20, verse 24 to 29. St. Thomas was alive after the resurrection of Lord Jesus when he inspected the marks of the crucifixion on the glorified spiritual flesh and bone body of Lord Jesus, then declared him his Lord and his God. That's John chapter 20, verse 28. Almost everything else you state is false, by the way. You surely don't know what you are talking about. Now, let's go back to that. Quran verse, sir, for Ayah 157. These are the Jews again. And for boasting, we killed the Messiah, Jesus, son of Mary, the messenger of Allah. But they, the Jews, neither killed nor crucified him. It was only made to appear so. Even those who argue for this crucifixion are in doubt. They have no knowledge whatsoever, only making assumptions. They, the Jews, certainly did not kill him. Well, number one, the Jews didn't crucify him. The Romans did. The Jews weren't allowed to do such things. And number two, as you'll see, no one killed him. He gave up his life. Okay, so you can look at, uh, if you just look at the words of the Quran, that, that, those words don't necessarily contradict what actually happened. Because number one, notice the Jews, they're boasting we killed their Messiah. They didn't even believe he was the Messiah. So they're kind of making fun of him by saying that. And guess what? They didn't kill him, they didn't crucify him, the Romans killed him, and no man killed him. He gave up his life on his own. The Romans crucified him, the Jews neither crucified him, nor killed him, no man killed him, and again, they didn't even think it was their Messiah anyway. So notice how your scholars, what they've taught you, Holly Aldehir, is not even what the Quran teaches. Now, here is the issue. Uh, uh, Quran, Surah 3, Ayah 3. He has revealed to you, O Prophet, the book and truth confirming what came before it, as he revealed the Torah and the Gospel. So notice, according to the Quran, the Quran confirms the Torah and the Gospel, all of these coming from Allah. 
Surah 6, Ayah 115, the word of your Lord has been perfected in truth and justice. None can change his words. And he's the all-hearing, all-knowing. So notice what the Quran teaches here, that the words of Allah cannot be changed, and the gospel is the word of Allah, the Torah is the word of Allah, and so is the Quran. So no one can change the words of the Torah or the gospel. So it hasn't been corrupted. Uh, Surah 18, Ayah 27, recite what has been revealed to you from the book of your Lord. None can change his words nor can you find any refuge beside him. Reiterating that point. Uh, Surah 5, Ayah 68. Say, O prophet, O people of the book, that's Jews and Christians like me, I'm a Christian, you have nothing to stand on unless you observe the Torah, the gospel, what has been revealed to you from your Lord. Amen. I observe the Torah. I observe the gospel. I observe what's been revealed to me by my Lord. My, my Lord and my God, Lord Jesus Christ. And your Lord's revelation to you, O prophet, will only cause many of them to increase in wickedness and disbelief. So do not, do not grieve for the people who disbelieve. Yes, if you believe, forgive me, if you disbelieve the Torah, that's wicked. If you disbelieve the gospel, that's wicked. John chapter 10, verse 18. Again, Lord Jesus speaking, no man taketh it from me, meaning his life, but I lay it down on myself. I have power to lay it down and I have power to take it again. See, he laid down his life in that physical body made like Adam. And then he took it up again in a glorified, heavenly, spiritual flesh and bone body. But it's a body, it's not a spirit. This commandment I've received of my father. Matthew chapter 27, verse 22. Pilate saith unto them, Jews, what shall I do then with Jesus, which is called Christ? They all say unto him, let him be crucified. See, the Jews weren't able to crucify him. So of course they didn't crucify him. They weren't able to, the Romans crucified him. Matthew chapter 27, verse 35. And they crucified him, the Romans, and parted his garments, casting lots, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet, that's David. They parted my garments among them, and upon my vesture did they cast lots. When we looked at um, Eli, Eli, Lama, Sabachthani, Azaphthani, um, from Psalm 22, 1. Here's Psalm 22, 18. They part my garments among them and cast lots upon my vesture. John chapter 19, verse 30. When Jesus therefore had received the vinegar, he said, it is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up the ghost. See, no man killed him. He allowed his spirit to leave his body. He allowed that physical body to die. No one killed him. Do you see the difference? John chapter 19, verse 33. But when they came to Jesus, these are the Romans, and saw that he was dead already, they break not his legs. So they wanted to get the bodies off the cross because of the holidays and the Sabbath, etc. So the other two thieves, they broke their legs and they suffocated and died and they killed them. When they came to Lord Jesus to break his legs, he was already dead. So they didn't kill him. He gave up his life. He did die, though, and he was crucified, although the Jews didn't crucify him, and no one killed him. Acts chapter 2, verse 23, him being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God, ye, Jews, have taken and by wicked hands the heathen Romans have crucified and slain. So, notice, they didn't believe he was their Messiah, and the Romans are the ones who crucified him. And again, Acts chapter 3, verse 14, again, speaking to these unbelieving Jews, but ye denied the Holy One and the just. They didn't believe you was their Messiah. That's the whole point. And desired a murderer to be granted unto you. John chapter 20, verses 24 to 29. But Thomas, one of the twelve, after the resurrection, eight days later, called Didymus, was not with them when Jesus came. The other disciples therefore said unto him, We have seen the Lord, his resurrected body. But he said unto them, this is Thomas, except I see in his hand the print of the nails from his crucifixion and put my finger to the print of the nails from his crucifixion and thrust my hand into a side from when the Roman uh, soldier put the spear into his dead body, I will not believe. And after eight days again, his disciples were within and Thomas with them. Then came Jesus, the doors being shut. Why is that detail there? Because Jesus physically materialized in a room with the doors being shut. That's a miracle. A man can't do that. A prophet can't do that. Muhammad couldn't do that. Lord Jesus did. Why? Because he's not a man. He's a God man. He's not a prophet. And stood in the midst and said, Peace be unto you. Then saith he to Thomas, Reach hither thy finger and behold my hands, and reach hither the hand and thrust it in my side, and be not faithless but believing. Right? He's showing him the physical wounds of his crucifixion that were still in that resurrected uh, spiritual flesh and bone body. And Thomas answered and said unto my Lord and my God, O mu keotheos mu. Why did he respond that way? Because Lord Jesus just proved that he's his Lord and he's his God. Why? Because a man and a prophet can't materialize in a room. A man and a prophet can't resurrect his own body. And a man and a prophet can't hear him, hear his challenge about, you know, I'm not going to believe in, unless I put my finger in the print of his nails and thrust my hand into his side. And Lord Jesus heard that and that's what he basically told him in uh, verse uh, uh, 27 there. That's why Thomas reacts that way. And notice 
Jesus' response. Does he say, whoa, 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 I'm not your Lord, I'm not your God, I'm just a man, I'm just a prophet. No, Jesus accepts the worship. Jesus accepts Thomas seeing and believing upon him correctly. Jesus said then, Thomas, because thou hast seen me, thou have believed. Why? You see me resurrected. You've seen me materialized in the room. You've seen the the, the, the marks in my hands and in my side, and I, I heard what you said when I wasn't even in the room. Why? Because I'm God, and I'm with you always. I'm omnipresent. Blessed are they that have not seen and have believed. See, traditional Christians are blessed. Muslims are not blessed because they don't believe the truth. John chapter 20, verse 30 to 31. Many other signs or miracles truly did Jesus in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written, these miracles, that ye might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. He is your Lord. He is your God. He's mine. He's yours. He's Satan's. He's Muhammad's. He's everyone's. And that believing ye might have life through his name. John chapter 21. After these things, Jesus showed himself again to his disciples at the Sea of Tiberias, and on this wise showed he himself. These were together Simon Peter and Thomas called Didymus. I mean, what a joke. So John's gospel shows Thomas in chapter 20 and Thomas in chapter 21 alive, interacting with the resurrected Lord. Amazing. And Nathaniel of Cain and Galilee and the sons of Zebedee, that's James and John, and two other of his disciples. Interesting. Five disciples are mentioned by name and two others aren't mentioned. Who are those? So, as you can see here, everything Holly Aldehir wrote is false. He doesn't know or she doesn't know what uh, she or he are talking about, and I don't blame them. Uh, why? Because they don't have the Holy Spirit. And as you saw in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14, without the Holy Spirit, you can't understand the things of God. And the Torah is of God. The um, uh, gospel is of God. The Quran, that's for you to, you, you to make up your own mind. But uh, my prayer is that you know, if your heart is sincere and you want to know the truth, you'll pray to God and ask him to reveal himself truly to you and show you who Lord Jesus is. Is he just a man? Is he just a prophet? Or is he your Lord and your God? And if that is sincere, you will know the truth and possibly you'll have a dream where Lord Jesus reveals himself to you as your Lord and as your God. And you will not just meet my brother and sister of humanity, you'll meet my brother and sister and Lord Jesus Christ. And you'll fulfill the will of the Father and you'll grow the family and you'll stand with me on the right hand of Lord Jesus at that last day, the day of resurrection, right? The day of the judgment of the sheep and the goats, the great white throne judgment. And we will dwell forever with the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, all the saints, the Virgin Mary in the new heaven, in the new earth, in the new creation, in the new Jerusalem forever. That's my prayer. Amen. I pray I spoke truth and interpret Holy Scripture correctly so that this discussion might have been a blessing to you, the viewer and listener. All truth comes from God. Any errors were my own. If it was a blessing to you, I would greatly appreciate if you could like, comment, share, and subscribe to the channel. Lord willing, we shall meet again. May the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit bless us all. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus.